Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Nurhana binti J. Ismail So today uh, our group which is group 2 will present about the lesion on palate This is the list of our group members which is Asrani Abdul Ghani Awak Firdaus bin Abdul Aziz Next is Fatih Najwa binti Irrahman Then Najwa Adriana binti Abdul Rahim Nurul Hana binti Cik Ismail and lastly Nurul Ayuni binti Nizan. This is the contents of our presentation today which is firstly introduction that will be presented by me. Next is Najwa will present about the risk factors. Not only that, Nurul Ayuni will present about the clinical manifestation. Then Asruni will present about the management and lastly Najla and Awa will present about the case study. So, for the introduction, um, what is the meaning of the lesion actually? Lesion is defined as a generalized term used to refer to an altered tissue, either shape, size, color, above the level of the mucosa, below the level of the mucosa, or the same level of the mucosa. So, in our presentation, we will be focusing on the lesion on the palate. There are some diseases that can occur on the palate, which is angina hemorrhagica bullosa, which is the blood blister, midline granuloma, mucomycosis, nasopalatine duxis, palatal ulcer due to use of the local anesthetics, papillomatosis of the palate, torus palatinus, Candidiasis, orotogenic fistula, salivary adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, pyogenic granuloma, non Hodgkin lymphoma, nevus pigmented, for example blue nevus, multiple myelomas, which is Kahler's disease. There are some of these diseases that occur because of oral cancer. Oral cancer can be divided into benign and malignant. Benign tumor refers to a condition, tumor or growth that is not cancerous that occurs on palate. Meanwhile, malignant is defined as the presence of the cancerous cells that have the ability to metastasize or to invade nearby and destroy tissues around the palate. Assalamualaikum. My name is Fatin Nurnajwa binti A. Rahman. I'll proceed with the presentation of um, of risk factors of lesions on palate. So through my readings of several articles and journals online, I found some risk factors that may contribute to the progression of lesions on palate. These risk factors vary between each patient where some may occur concurrently or independently. The risk factors of lesions on palate includes immunosuppressive drugs, ill-fitting dentures, excessive alcohol consumption, reverse tobacco smoking habit, tobacco use, age, and underlying systemic disease. First is the immunosuppressive drugs, which is primarily used post-transplant surgery as to reduce and suppress the strength of the body's immune system. It is to ensure that the body will less likely to reject the transplanted organs. However, due to the suppression of the body's immune system, it may result in patients to be at risk of possible post-transplant infections such as herpes simplex virus infection. Note that HSV infections is the most common oral infections in post-transplant patients, which may cause the development of oral lesions. Next is the ill-fitting dentures. Ill-fitting dentures are dentures produced which are loose and not fitted properly to the patient's mouth. This will lead to poor retention between the denture base and the mucosa of the oral cavity as well as mechanical trauma to the patient, thus resulting in the development of lesions in the oral cavity, particularly on the palate and soft tissue of the alveolar bone. Moreover, it also may cause presence of candida infection in the oral cavity caused by poor retention of the denture. Candida infection may contribute to the progression of lesions on the palate in the oral cavity. Other than that, reverse tobacco smoking habit can also cause lesions on palate. It can cause nicotinic stomatitis, which is a palatal lesion that may mimic leukoplakia or erythroplakia. Reverse tobacco smoking habit may also cause excrescence on the palate. It is reported this is due to entry of toxins from the tobacco smoke through hypertrophic ductal openings of minor salivary gland. Besides, 
the heat and chemical release from the lip end of the tobacco causes chronic irritation that may lead to malignancy such as squamous metaplasia. On top of that, excessive alcohol consumption is also another risk factor of lesions on palate. The cytotoxic effect on bacteria of an alcohol causes changes in the saliva bacterium interaction. Moreover, alcohol also contains ethanol, which allows bacteria to use it as substrate for bacterial metabolism. This leads to changes in the oral microbiome that affects cancerogen metabolism and the immune system, thus causing local oral diseases. Next is the tobacco use. An increase in smoking habit concomitantly with extreme alcohol intake will also cause increase in tobacco carcinogen permeation by increasing membrane permeability of the oral mucosa epithelial cells. So consequently, it will result in progression of lesions in oral cavity by changes of mucosal epithelium due to the carcinogens. Besides that, age is also an important risk factor of lesions on palate. Elderly usually presented with a condition of hyposalivation where their salivary flow rate is reduced. Saliva affects greatly in balancing pH of the oral cavity, balancing oral microbial activity as well as providing retention to the denture base. However, in a case of hyposalivation, it may cause sensitive points in the mucosa and poor retention between denture base and the mucosa. Later, it will give rise to development of mucosal lesions in the patient's mouth. Finally, it is the underlying systemic disease. In some cases, Systemic diseases may be presented with oral manifestations. As mouth is also a part of the human's body, thus it is connected with other body systems such as circulatory system, which is the most significant that cause oral manifestations of the underlying systemic disease. Pathogenic cells may migrate from the site of disease to the oral cavity through circulatory system, including blood vessels and lymphatic drainage. Some examples of underlying systemic disease that produce oral manifestations are Crohn's disease and lupus erythematosus. Crohn's disease may present with diffuse mucosal swelling, cobblestone appearance on the mucosa, and ulceration in the oral cavity. Meanwhile, lupus erythematosus may bring about oral presentation of ulceration, honeycomb plug, and raised keratotic plug in the oral cavity. Note that these oral findings are significant as it may reveal findings indicative of underlying systemic condition and allow for early diagnosis and treatment. Okay, next I would like to present about clinical manifestation of lesion on palate. First, uh, we have angina bullosa hemorrhagica. It is uh, usually solitary, up to 2 cm in dimension. For midline granuloma, it is usually a rise ulcerative, necrotizing, an obstructive lesion, while for mucromycosis, uh, you can see in this uh, picture, uh, it is uh, also with necrosis in the anterior palate. Next, uh, we have nasopalatine duxis. It is well-defined firm non-tender swelling seen on the left side of anterior head palate. And next picture, you can see palatal ulcer due to local anesthesia. The ulcer was uh, 10 mm in diameter surrounded by hematoma and it is roughly oval in shape with well-defined punch-out margins and a depth of 2-3 to three mm. Next, we have dental papillomatosis. It is uh, usually characterized by erythematous, pebbly appearance of the palatal bulb. For information, for advanced uh, case, as a bit, uh, it has a bit more pronounced papillar lesion of the heart palate. For torus palatinus, we have three figures. For figure 1, we can see midline bony nodule of the palatal bulb. For figure 2, we have large lobulated palatal mass. And lastly, figure 3, we can see asymm asymmetric lobulated bony. Next, uh, candidiasis. We have six uh, clinical manifestations of candidiasis. First, pseudomembranous candidiasis. It is a whitish yellow creamy plaques on the surface of the oral mucosa. Second, erythematous candidiasis. Uh, it is characterized by localized erythema of the oral mucosa. Third, uh, we have hyperplastic candidiasis. As you can see in the picture, uh, it well demarcated slightly elevated, adherent white lesion of the oral mucosa. Next, a denture associated erythematous candidiasis. 
as you can see in the picture the lesion present erythema and edema restricted uh, to the denture supporting area for angular cellulitis it appears clinically as erythematous fissures cilin uh, affecting the angles of the mouth lastly median rhomboid glossitis the lesion is characterized by a symmetrical erythematous elliptical or rhomboid like area there are four pictures for endotogenic uh, fistula. For picture B, you can see uh, the endotogenic cutaneous fistula was observed by orientating the root apex to 3 sig to overlying cortical plates and muscular attachment. For picture C, you can see resected fistula tract. Now we have salivary adenocarcinoma. The, the mass of posterior lateral heart palate is seen in the picture and next square uh, squamous cell carcinoma first picture you can see granular erythroplakia of the floor of the mouth on the patient's right side and next you can see an exophytic lesion with an irregular and pebble surface which has a linear indentation biogenic granuloma it is characterized by erythematous hemorrhagic arising from the maxillary anterior gingiva Next picture, the patient uh, was suffered from HIV associated lymphoma. Uh, the lesion is characterized by erythematous and ulcerated soft tissue enlargement of the posterior mandibular, gingiva, and mucobacal fold on the right side. Lastly, we have blue nevus and multiple myeloma. For blue nevus, uh, it is well circumscribed deep blue macular lesion is seen on parietal mucosa and lastly for multiple myeloma it is soft uh, granular fibre non-tender and red or magenta enlargement of gingiva okay now we look at the management of lesions on palate for angina hemorrhagica bullosa treatment is unnecessary as the blister will spontaneously rupture soon after its development further healing takes place without scar formation However, some patients may experience repeated recurrences. For midline granuloma, the treatment of choice is local radiation. In advanced cases, the use of non anthracycline combination chemotherapy may be helpful, although in such instances, the prognosis remains poor. For mucomycosis, antifungal treatment with high-dose amphotericin B remains the most generally effective drug for most systemic mycosis. Liposomal amphotericin is less toxic and as effective Cataconazole and its analogs have mainly been used for maintenance. There should also be treatment of the underlying cause, if possible, and removal of necro necrotic bone. For nasopalatine duxis, no treatment or follow-up is required in asymptomatic cases. However, in symptomatic cases, enucleation or marsupialization is indicated. There is a low recurrence rate for both scenarios. For palatal ulcer due to local anesthetics, Treatment is unnecessary. For papillomatosis of the palate, surgical excision is a treatment of choice. However, the physician may also opt for electrocautery excision, cryosurgery, intralesional interferon injection, or laser ablation. There is a low recurrence rate for single type lesions compared to multiple type lesions. In torus palatinus, the lesions are entirely benign and surgical correction is only indicated for aesthetic reasons or interference with the wearing of an upper denture. In candidiasis, treatment is mainly indicated in symptomatic cases and should primarily be directed at elimination of predisposing factors, followed by administration of topical antifungal such as nystatin or amphotericin. In persistent cases, systemic antifungals may be indicated, and in males with candidiasis and suspected HIV infection, they may respond to fluconazole or itraconazole. In odontogenic fistula, first they should remove the source of infection either via root canal treatment or dental extraction followed by a fistulectomy. No systemic antibiotics need to be prescribed as the lesion is a localized entity, but they should be considered in patients with diabetes, immunosuppression or signs of systemic infection. In salivary adenocarcinoma, surgical resection is the mainstay treatment. Therapeutic night dissection is recommended for patients who have clinical or radiologic evidence of cervical metastasis. And for patients with inoperable disease, 
those who refuse surgery or those who have an unresectable tumor, primary radiotherapy should be considered. In squamous cell carcinoma, patients who are at stage 1 to 2 should undergo surgery or radiotherapy. Stage 3 to 4b should undergo surgery, chemo radiation or induction therapy. And past stage 4c should undergo chemotherapy. In pyogenic granuloma, surgical excision is the treatment of choice. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can be managed by chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery in various combinations. There is a good prognosis in localized disease and a poor prognosis in disseminated disease. For Blue Universe, the treatment of choice is surgical excision and it comes with a good prognosis. For multiple myelomas, initially all patients will be treated with chemotherapy, either with mephalin or combination including steroids. Remission is maintained by interferon, thalidomide, or lenalidomide, and patients may undergo a bone marrow transplant during remission. For patients with widespread bone metastasis, biphosphonates may be indicated. However, they carry a risk of biphosphonate-induced jaw necrosis. Now, let's discuss a case example on Torres palatinus. Highlighted are the informations that are correlated to three cases which involve 57-year-old Caucasian men who presented heart nodules in the heart palate, 40-year-old Caucasian woman who was referred for frequent trauma of palatal mucosa during mastication, aesthetic complaint, and discomfort caused by the trauma of her tongue in this area, and lastly, a 45-year-old Caucasian woman who presented with a lesion on the palate that caused difficulty swallowing. In the first case, the patient is a 57-year-old Caucasian man who sought oral rehabilitation of his edentalus maxilla. History taking and risk factor are medical history of no any comorbidity, but the presence of torus palatinus impaired the confection of upper complete denture. Her oral examination revealed a heart nodule at the midline of heart palate of approximately 1.5 cm covered by healthy mucosa as shown in the picture. For her diagnosis, a few procedures were performed such as surgical removal of the exostosis under local anesthesia, a single wide incision to expose the bone, followed by segmental osteotomy under plentiful irrigation, removal of bone fragments with chisel, nylon sutures, and compression. The microscopical examination of the specimen confirmed the diagnosis of torus palatinus. The patient management is rehabilitated with complete denture four months later as the patient did not experience any sign of recurrence. A 40-year-old woman was having trauma of palatal mucosa during mastication with aesthetic complaint and discomfort caused by the trauma of her tongue. The oral examination revealed a nodular and heart swelling covered by healthy mucosa at the midline of the heart palate, which extends from the height of the first molars to the middle of the third ones. Approximated dimension was 2 cm. Medical records were not contributory. The clinical diagnosis was palatine torus. Due to the functional impairment, surgical excision under local anesthesia with the same technique was done as employed in the first case. Microscopical analysis of the removed specimen confirmed the diagnosis of torus palatinus. The four-month follow-up was uneventful. A 45-year-old woman was presented with a lesion on the palate that caused difficulty to swallow. Oral examination revealed a lobulated and hard nodule with a 5 cm diameter located in the midline of the palate and covered by healthy mucosa. The swelling was painless and presented slow growth without signs of inflammation. Medical history did not reveal any comorbidity. Total maxilla occlusal radiography was performed to rule out the presence of neoplasia and to examine the shape and size of the bony prominence. It showed a radio-opaque lobular lesion on the heart palate midline. Due to the functional discomfort, surgical excision under local anesthesia with the same technique employed in the previous cases was done. Microscopical analysis of the specimen confirmed the diagnosis of torus palatinus. The post-operative period of four weeks showed good healing of the surgical area.